Good afternoon. Well, I got the toughest speaking slot of the day right after lunch. <laughs> Thank you for coming to the uh, Texas Motorcycle Safety Forum. My name is Emory Sauter. I'm a government affairs manager with the American Motorcyclist Association, headquartered in Pickerington, Ohio. And just for the sake of admission, uh, I am a recovering engineer. I retired from telecommunication uh, several years ago and had an opportunity to come work for the AMA as a second career. So for me, it's a labor of love. It's chasing a passion and being able to share with the riding community and our members uh, issues that I hold near and dear to my heart. I'm also a former motorcycle safety instructor. I taught with the program in Ohio for 10 years. So a lot of the issues that we discussed this morning are very near and dear to all of you who are instructors or chief instructors, but I have a, a very wonderful perspective in that coming from the rider education community, I can now go in and with legislators and regulators convey to them the importance of rider education. And that's been one of the points that I've really tried to focus on at the AMA is focusing on rider education, why I feel it's important and the benefits that it pays back to the riding community. So again, thank you for the opportunity, Keith, and, and the folks that put this together for the invitation to come. What I'd like to do is change the focus just a little bit. When, when Keith and I started exchanging emails and talking, he told me what the forum was about and the things that were going to be discussed. And he said, let's bring in some things from a legislative perspective. Let's talk about some of the things that are really important. So I picked three of the easiest things I could find. Motorcycle sound, which is completely a non-controversial issue in every state, including Texas. But I also wanted to talk about lane splitting and something that we're just now starting to see emerge in the country, which are called road guards. So in the half hour that I've been given, the opportunity to, to work with you today. I'd like to touch on these and then uh, yield to my, my wonderful colleague from uh, Illinois. Brief introduction, talk about the motivation. What, why even talk about these topics? And then as I said, motorcycle sound, lane splitting, road guards, and a, and a conclusion. For those of you who don't know, the AMA was founded in 1924. Uh, we have been in central Ohio for all but one year of our existence. We have three areas in government relations, one in the Washington, D.C. area, Pickerington office in Ohio, where I am, and we have a gentleman who works out of a home office, or he claims to work out of a home office in California. We don't often see him. Uh, we work on behalf of riders in the motorcyc on motorcycling-related issues, importantly at the international and federal level. Many of the state motorcyclist rights organizations do a wonderful job at the state and local level, a big part of our focus is at the international and federal level. We as an organization have NGO or non-governmental organization status with the UN, so we're able to participate in much of the discussion that's going on at the international level. And we really depend on our members. The members of our organization are the strength. As an organization, we have less than 80 full-time staff members, so with 200,000 plus members, we depend on them to be our eyes and ears in the field and also to be the activists to help us with legislative and regulatory issues. Why even discuss these issues? What's the connection between motorcycle sound and, and motorcycle safety? Loud pipes save lives, right? Oh, they don't. Oh, maybe I've touched on a controversial topic then. We're going to share some legislative and regulatory information with you. And by the way, all of this information will be available in a PDF document with clickable links. So everything you see in this presentation will be up on the website following this. And all the links that are in here are click-through links. So it's legislation or anything that's referenced in here will be in the PDF document. I hope to provide you some resources to talk about uh, establishing practical solutions to the three topics we may touch on today and to encourage participation because as we have saw this morning, up here presenting is not the way things get done. What it is is a stimulus to start a discussion and with the various backgrounds and writing experience of people in this room and even the non-writers have an opportunity to contribute to the discussion and hopefully address some of the solutions which ultimately we all want to see the crashes reduced. We want to see the numbers of our brothers and sisters dying and being seriously injured. We want to see those reduced. So ultimately, that's part of our motivation. Motorcycle sound. What's the issue with motorcycle sound? Loud pipes make angry registered orders. Yeah. <laughs> As a former member of our chairman of the board, or former chair of the board said, loud pipes risk rights. 
And I think all of those in the community who would say, well, I would not be here today had I not had straight pipes on my bike, a lot of us in the riding community can say, yes, but a lot of people ride factory stock motorcycles that don't have modified exhaust systems, and we're still here today to talk about it. So at least let's have the discussion about why this sound is an issue. Is it an issue in Texas? Is this a hot button issue in Texas? Yes, it is. Okay, from a dealer's perspective, I'm sure there are some unique obligations and issues from a dealer's perspective. How about in the user community? Is it, is it a hot button issue in the user community? If you're no different than the other states, I'm sure it is, because there's one camp that said loud pipes saves lives, and the other camp that says loud pipes risk rights. So somehow we can make the connection here that maybe running with your loud pipes or the horn button taped down is not a good motorcycle safety solution. But what does that mean for us in the riding community? Are there particular locations in Texas where there's stepped up enforcement on this particular issue? How about in your large urban settings? Has this become enough of an issue that law enforcement is putting a, a, a focus on excessively loud motorcycles? We're starting to see this in some other communities in other states. Okay, so now we're talking about the off-highway community as well, and, and they are part of our community, so yes, that's something we do need to take into consideration. Here's something, again, the dealers. Have the dealers taken a position on this? Because you know, they're business people. They're in the business to make money, to sell motorcycles, and to sell products. But they don't want to be on the wrong side of the law. They don't want to be on the wrong side of public opinion. They don't want to be on the wrong side of the riding community. So the dealers have a stake in this whole issue as well. Here's from my perspective of almost 13 years at the AMA. Most common complaint regarding motorcycles received by elected officials, regulators, and law enforcement from business owners and the public. This is the number one issue around the country with state regulators and, and, and regulators is excessive sound. Most common reason given for restricting or banning motorcycles from public and private property. Some people would argue if the bikes were quiet, we'd let them in parking garages. We'd let them in the city parks. We'd let them in the state parks. It's an excuse, but is it valid? Looking back at the history, I would say in some cases it is. It's the most common issue misunderstood by the riding community. Some of the riding community claim there is no state law that impacts me. I can do whatever I want. So all the way around, this is a hot button issue. And how does it connect to safety? Well, one of the issues, again, is if, as we discussed this morning, if you can't see me, maybe if you hear me, I'll be a safer motorcyclist. And some of us can say, well, maybe not. Maybe there are other steps you can take. And one of the hardest things to do as a riding community is to look in the mirror and say, I have some responsibility for what's going on out there. And hopefully, uh, Mike will help you understand that better in the next presentation. State mobile source sound laws can be and often are different from the federal regulations. How many of you are aware of the federal regulations on motorcycle sound? I don't see a hand up in the room. They're complex, don't get me wrong, because this is a governmental entity issuing regulations. There's a link in here that'll help clarify that. No consistent laws or regulations between states or even within a state. You'll have state and local jurisdictions that are at odds with each other. How is that helpful in, under, in the riding community and law enforcement and regulators and elected officials understanding the law? And how do folks in the riding community defend that? Finally, enforcement varies at all levels, federal, state, and local. This has become an enforcement issue in the sense that the public perceives it as not being enforced. Because from the law enforcement perspective, if they don't know the law, if they don't know how to do the testing, if they don't know what the standards are, law enforcement isn't going to try to do anything about the problem. This is where the federal regulations come from. They're established by the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards. They're contained in, in part, or Title 40, Code of Federal Regulations 205, subparts D and E. If you ever suffer from insomnia, just go to this website and start to read this information. It will put you to sleep. But the most important thing is there are federal regulations that govern the sale of new products, new motorcycles in this country, and also govern the sale of aftermarket products related to uh, motorcycle exhaust systems, all contained here at this link. This is very difficult to see because it's black on the background. I think the most important thing to realize is that since 19, model year 1986, there have been federal regulations that say 
on a pass-by test, no motorcycle can exceed 80 decibels as measured at 50 feet when this vo uh, motorcycle is under acceleration using the A-weighted scale to, to measure it. So it's 80 dB, dBA, measured at 50 feet on a pass-by test. And that's federal? That's the federal standard. That is correct. 80 decibels from 1986 on. It's been the, it's been the regulation, the law of the land. So no new motorcycle sold in this country Total vehicle noise can exceed 80 decibels on the pass-by test. Now, one people, people will say, this is virtually impossible to replicate in the field, and there's some, there's some truth to that. Measuring that, or taking that standard reading in the field, doing it this way is virtually impossible. So as you'll see later, the enforcement issue certainly has, has been a challenge. The rest of this, again, uh, deals with uh, off-highway motorcycles and mopeds, but for street motorcycles, Anything above 170 cc's, the law has been 80 decibels since model year 1986. What has happened at the state and federal level, though, and this is, and, and I'm sorry, the state and local level, this is where the, the proof is in the pudding. Two cities, a city of Boston, Massachusetts, and Boulder, Colorado, have local ordinances that say all motorcycles must comply with the federal regulation in that the exhaust systems must be labeled in compliance with the federal regulations. So not only from a sound perspective, but the pipes themselves, the exhaust systems, must be labeled to meet the federal regulations. And this is where the wheels come off the wagon, because in both Boston and Denver's case, it says that label has to be in compliance with the federal regulations. Well, those of you who understand the aftermarket industry understand that it's been very difficult for the aftermarket industry to comply with that for various reasons. So most of the aftermarket systems are not labeled in accordance with the federal regulations or the label says for competition use only. And that again says that pipe is not legal for use on the street. State actions, three in particular. California, when Governor Schwarzenegger, the Terminator, was governor, he signed very sweeping legislation that said all motorcycles sold starting January 1st of 2013 and all motorcycle exhaust systems, so the aftermarket systems, must comply with the federal regulations in terms of labeling. So no motorcycle or aftermarket pipe sold in California starting January 1st of 2013 can be legally sold without the compliance label. That was their answer. How does that address the sound issue? Well, if it's a label on there, and what if I rip the guts out of the stock pipe? So now I've got a stock pipe that's labeled, meets the law, but it's loud as hell, folks. So we really haven't addressed, and everything that was on the street was grandfathered in. So it really didn't address it. State of Maine and the state of New Hampshire took a slightly different approach. How many of you are familiar with the roadside test that was released by the SAE in 2009 called the J2825? Okay, this is a roadside test procedure with a sound meter measured at a distance of 20 inches at a 45 degree angle from the pipe, and all it does is measure the exhaust sound. It doesn't measure total vehicle noise. And so the SAE proposed that as an alternative to doing the kind of testing the federal government does to ensure compliance. And so the state of Maine actually adopted it, as did the state of New Hampshire, but Maine has since rescinded that. So there is an alternative approach to, to excessive sound. More importantly, though, at the federal level, and this is, this is where it's going to get interesting, and this is kind of why I wanted to include it here to give everybody a heads up. In October of 2012, there was a meeting in Washington, D.C. that involved a number of people with an interest in motorcycle sound. I was invited as a representative of the riding community, and this actually is, is quoted from the final report. The reason for the meeting was to discuss motorcycle noise in America, its adverse impact on the public, and the feasibility of making the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's regulations more user-friendly for state and local enforcement officials to adopt and enforce. This was the flare that went up and said the feds have realized that after 30 plus years, the federal regulations don't work. The only area where they've worked is they forced the dealers to sell compliant motor vehicles or the manufacturers, the OEMs, but everything else, there's no enforcement at the federal regulations. The aftermarket industry is in a state of disarray. So what's going to come out of this, and this is just my prediction, is that within a few years, they are going to open a rulemaking process to revisit the whole regulation of motorcycle sound at the federal level. 
And so there is a report online, and again, this URL is very difficult to see, but it will be on the, on the uh, PDF. If you click to that, there is a document out there called Noisy Motorcycles, an Environmental Quality of Life Issue. That's the full report of this roundtable and its recommendations. Yes, sir? In that uh, test, you mentioned the day 28. 25, yes, sir. The RPMs are, are, or the, the test procedure itself is, is pretty straightforward. No street legal motorcycle can exceed 92 decibels at idle. That's, that's one of the tests. So no motorcycle can exceed 92 measured at 20 inches at a 45 degree angle. There is a two degree bump up for pipes that are properly labeled so they could go as high as 94, but the specification says 92. Then they divide it out and they say for three and four cylinder motorcycles, they cannot exceed 100 decibels at 5,000 RPM. And for all others, so twins, six cylinders, singles, cannot exceed 96 decibels measured at 2,000 RPM. That's the test procedure. And so it can be done roadside, it can be done in inspection stations. It's very straightforward. The motorcycle is stationary in neutral, requires one person to do the test and one potentially to hold the throttle at the specified RPM. That's it. Okay. Moving on, lane splitting. How many of you have ever split lanes? How many of you split lanes legally? Oh, all those hands went down. Not me, not me. Okay, where is it legal to split lanes in the United States? Really? Ah, very good, very good. Somebody got a hold of the notes here before the presentation. There's a huge distinction between legal and practiced or tolerated. And so uh, we'll get to that in just a second, but he's, he's reading ahead. What are the advantages of lane splitting? What are the advantages of lane splitting? Why would you want a lane split? Keeps your motorcycle from overheating. Keeps your motorcycle from overheating, good. What else? Keeps the rider from overheating. Keeps the rider from overheating. Reduces congestion for everyone. Reduces congestion. How about your safety? Are you safer sitting in a line and potentially becoming a Ford sandwich or the filling between a Ford, in a Ford sandwich? Or maybe going between the vehicles and continuing to move upstream? Depends. I mean, there's no, there's no universal answer. It depends. Okay. What are the dangers? Road rage. Road rage. Cigarette, tobacco juice, anything else coming out the window, an open door, a vehicle turning, the list goes on and on and on. Would the public accept lane splitting in Texas? Judging by my drive from Austin to here yesterday, uh-uh. They don't accept rental cars, let alone people <laughs> lane splitting. You don't that want anybody head up. <laughs> Would you lane split in Texas no. if it was legal? Yes. yes. No. Okay. Now, let me ask, show of hands, how many people would lane split if it was legal in Texas? Okay, hands for those who would not. And non-riders don't count, only motorcyclists. Okay, so it's maybe about a 50-50 split here. This has become, believe it or not, one of those hot button issues and what triggered all this? What do you think triggered this? Well, lane splitting has been practiced around the world for years. In Europe, in Asia, in many other countries, lane splitting is expected. If you're not filtering up, or as it's called filtering, getting to the head of the line and, and zipping away at the light, there's something wrong with you. You must be a foreigner. You're not from around here. You don't understand the laws or the customs. California is the only state, and this is where your answer was correct, Lane splitting is permitted, it's not in currently in statute, and that's the big distinction. It's not specifically prohibited or permitted in the California Vehicle Code. It's tolerated, and this is actually what it says from the California, the CHP website. Can motorcycle riders split lanes and ride between other vehicles? And the answer is, lane splitting by motorcycles is permissible, but must be done in a safe and prudent manner. And this has been this way for years in California. Sir. What's the definition of safe and prudent? That's where it gets into the gray area. Absolutely. What's important, though, is that in, in February of 2013, the California Highway Patrol issued guidelines. And this is where the big distinction, and this is what started the discussion in California about lane splitting, again, 
is the CHP finally put some guidelines in place that said, for all you motorcyclists who've been doing this for 40 or 50 years, here are the guidelines. They were a little late in coming out, but it's a government agency, so you have to give them time. But it really started the discussion. And so as we went back and looked and we said, okay, well, the Motorcycle Industry Council, which is joined at the hip with the MSF, issued a position of, uh, of support in 2011. So it wasn't a new issue to them when the CHP guidelines came out. This is the actual link to the lane splitting guidelines from the CHP. Lo and behold, the AMA finally issued a position statement, board approved position statement in November of 2013, endorsing lane splitting. There's a huge difference between endorsing lane splitting because it is still a voluntary activity. In other words, if the law says you can do it, it doesn't say you must do it. And that's the cornerstone of our position statement saying, if it's practiced in a safe and prudent manner, per the CHP guidelines, we don't see a problem with it. However, there are some things you have to take into consideration, but it's not mandatory, folks. This is your choice. And that's the hinge for us in providing this as, as a, a position statement. Here's some lane splitting references. Again, I'm, I apologize for this being dark, but on the PDF document, you'll be able to click on these links and get you there. Uh, the state of Oregon did a very significant literature review on, on lane splitting. So if anybody's interested in those references, they're there. It's, it's a good document. Uh, motorcycle lane share study among California motorcyclists and drivers, 2012. So they actually did a survey to look at the attitudes of drivers and motorcyclists on this particular issue. So this study is, is pretty well done. And finally, there is a website, believe it or not, dedicated called Lane Splitting is Legal in California that's a proponent of lane splitting, duh. But a lot of folks who live there say, yeah, it's, it's been great, it's, it's a big time saver, and if you ever want to see a congested area, go to LA any time of the day or night. Now, I don't know why they make 10 lanes, because it just looks like a parking lot. But for motorcyclists to be able to go up through there, for them, it is a safety issue, it is a time saver issue. And so for those reasons, people who decide to lane split, it's a good deal for them. What about Texas, though? Is it a good deal for Texas? I have found 20 bills, looking back uh, to 2003, of states that considered legislation to either study the lane splitting issue or to make it legal in the state. And Texas has had three attempts that I could find. In 2005, the problem with that, and what I've put in parentheses here, is that the lane splitting bill in Texas in 2005 had a couple caveats. It said you had to have completed rider education and you must have had a minimum of $10,000 of medical insurance in order to split lanes. Now, for any law enforcement officers in the room, I'm gonna ask you, how do you know somebody's got 10K worth of medical insurance and completed a rider education program as they're zipping down the highway between cars? You don't. And that's been one of the issues is anytime legislation is passed, we'll turn to the folks in law enforcement and say, how do you implement this? How do you know something like this is gonna work? And so in any case where I have the word clean in there, it simply said the bill would allow lane splitting under certain conditions, but there were no caveats on it. Uh, the state of Massachusetts did something quite different. They said they would allow motorcyclists to use the breakdown lane or the right shoulder instead of actually splitting traffic when vehicles were stopped or riding under 10 or 20 miles an hour. Any of you ever driven in Massachusetts? Those people are crazy there. I can't imagine those people would tolerate the motorcyclist driving down the breakdown lane, waving, going, I'm moving, you're not. That's not gonna work in Massachusetts. So the public perception of why some of these bills don't go anywhere is if you're in a cage, you got the AC on, we're 3% of the, of the traffic community, the other 97% are stuck in traffic. What's that vote look like? It's a little lopsided when it comes to support, isn't it? So here again, are what I've been able to find, the state of New Jersey is, is in a, a perpetual state of study. They've had four bills or five bills during this 10-year period to study lane splitting. They can't even pass the legislation to establish a study committee. So I don't think lane splitting is going to happen in New Jersey anytime soon. The last attempt at lane splitting in Texas, I believe, was in your 2011 legislative session, and there was a helmet provision in there. And for some people in the community, that's not a trade-off they're willing to make. So when it comes to support like this, if the bill is clean, some people would say, yeah, it's an option. I can go with it or I can't. As soon as you start putting provisions in there, it sort of poisons the well. So again, this is uh, in Arizona, by the way, Mike, your new home came the closest. It actually made it through their legislature, but uh, Governor Brewer vetoed the bill. 
And that's a little unfortunate because I think there are areas in Arizona that may benefit, again, talk about being hot and sitting in traffic. I think Arizona would be a good candidate for, for that. So any additional considerations on lane splitting? Again, show of hands, how many motorcyclists would split lanes if it was legal in Texas? How many would not split lanes if it was legal in Texas? Okay. I didn't change any minds. Uh, the idea wasn't to change your mind, it's to give you some resources that if this issue comes up and, and some, a legislator asks you, what have other states done? This is, this is a 10 year look back. And, and the bills, again, all of these are, are PDF linked. So you just click on them and they'll bring the bill up and you can see them. And most of them are pretty straightforward. The last topic I'd like to touch on are road guards. And this is kind of a new phenomenon in the sense that we're talking about legally road guarding. How many of you, and I, we're not taking numbers, and the camera's pointed this way, not back, so they, they can't see you raising your hand. How many of you ever been involved in a motorcycle event and have taken it upon yourself as either a road captain or a road guard to stop traffic so that the rest of the procession could go through an intersection, just to show of hands? Okay, they're starting to go up slowly. Again, the camera's pointed at me, not you. Okay, so is that legal in Texas? Is it legal in any state for a non-authorized or non-sworn individual to jump out of his or her vehicle, go into an intersection and do one of these to stop traffic? There is a bill currently here that is, they're working its way through to get it legalized. Okay, but today? Okay, so of those of you who raised your hands, and again, the camera's looking at me, not you, um, what are the implications of you doing that? You felt you wanted to do that for the safety of the, of the group ride, right? For the safety of, of the event. What were the implications for you as an individual if something had gone wrong? First place, if you got cited, you'd have to deal with that. But what if somebody had actually been involved in a crash and there was a liability, a civil suit or something that came out and they said, they have you on the stand, they said, oh, oh sir, so you were blocking the intersection. Yes. Are you authorized to do so? No. Do you have any training to do so? No. Where do you think that suit's going to go? So the whole idea here with road guards is to start a conversation about augmenting, not replacing, but augmenting what our law enforcement community does for us on large group rides. And the idea was that the motorcycling community would put together a program working with the state departments of transportation and public safety to make non-law enforcement issues uh, uh, individuals trained and give them the equipment and the capability to assist during large motorcycle events. Do you agree that that would enhance motorcycle safety if it was done in that fashion like I just stated it? A couple head nods, now you're either going to sleep or you agree with me, but, but work with me, this will end quicker that way. We've answered a couple of the questions here. Here are some things that, to ensure as far as motorcycle events are concerned. Currently, do you work with local and state law enforcement agencies when you have big events to make sure that you are either escorted or that you have some kind of road guarding situation? Is, is that the norm in Texas today? Okay. What are some of the potential drawbacks to that? Funding, availability of law enforcement. You know, uh, people will say, well, the agency is committed. All of a sudden, they get called off to a special security detail or an emergency, and now you have no protection or no escort. So one of the things that the riding community has said to law enforcement, look, we're not trying to replace what you do. We're trying to supplement it. And in those cases where you're not available under certain circumstances, we, the community, properly trained with the right equipment, would like to have that capability to manage traffic. Again, from a safety perspective, I don't get a big head by standing out there with my hand out. What I am trying to do is minimize the risk to the participants in that event. So we've answered a couple of the questions here. And I wrote this because I, I believe that Minnesota is the first state that really has put a formal program in place. They're still putting it into place, as a matter of fact. They're the first state that I am aware of that has a formal program under development that would allow non-law enforcement personnel to stop and hold traffic under certain conditions during motorcycle events. Now I say they're still working on it because their uh, legislation was passed in 2012, but their Department of Public Safety has not yet issued the final rules of implementation for the program. And I was telling Mike a little bit earlier uh, before coming up here is that the DPS has a very extensive website. And again, this is hyperlinked. It's called Motorcycle Road Guard Certification Program where it lays out in detail all the public hearings, 
all of the information and input they've had from the community, from law enforcement, from the judiciary, from the legislature to try to make this program formal, such as how many motorcycles are required to be in the procession before we can actually call it uh, uh, available for an escort. Does it have to be sanctioned? Does it have to be insured? Is there prior notification that has to be given to all the jurisdictions where the ride is going? So all of those things are in the developmental phase. The legislation is the easy part. Most people say you're crazy for making that statement. The legislation is the easy part. It's the rules of implementation that are the hard thing. So Minnesota is still working through the program. Here are the states, or here's the legislation in 2012, Minnesota's legislation. A nod to the state of Illinois, they actually passed to reinforce that they already have that capability in Illinois. It's not a formal program yet like Minnesota's, but the state of Illinois does have the capacity to allow non-sworn or non-law enforcement officials to control traffic. State of Ohio, where I'm from, we are considering a bill that was brought by the State Motorcyclist Rights Organization, and we're working with legislators and law enforcement and the traffic safety community to hash out the details. What we're doing is though we're looking to Minnesota and I heard the word copy used this morning. We're not trying to copy it, but we want to tailor it so that it may work for us in Ohio and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Finally, the state of Washington had two bills this session, a House and a Senate bill that would allow for a motorcycle road guard certification program, but both of those bills did not make it through the legislature this time. So the connection here with rider safety is this is something that a few of you admitted to doing. Again, understanding that this is not legally permitted, but you're doing it from a safety perspective. And let me ask this, how many of you would be in favor of supporting something like this in the state of Texas from a motorcycle safety standpoint? Just a show of hands. Okay, how many of you would not be in favor of seeing a road guard program implemented in the state of Texas? Okay. So legislatively, that's where it starts. Sitting down with a legislator, and whether you're a rider, coach, or trainer, you have something to contribute to the discussion. It's important to involve the Department of Public Safety, law enforcement, anybody with a stake in this, the businesses, the dealers, they need to be involved in this, because quite frankly, a lot of these events start and end at dealerships, and dealerships are very keen on safety, very keen on having organized events for their customers, and they want safety as well. So everybody has a stake in a program like this. So again, use these as resources to look at what's being done if you hear that there's some interest on motorcycle road guards in the state of Texas. Some issues to consider, who's responsible for develop, developing and implementing the program. In the case of Minnesota and Ohio, it's the Department of Public Safety that's gonna be tasked with implementing the program. Does the program have the support of law enforcement agencies? It's critical because A, it won't get through the legislature in most cases unless law enforcement supports it. And B, you want law enforcement on your side if you're looking at doing a program like this because they have the expertise in traffic control. We can learn from them. What will the program cost and who will pay for it? Under what circumstances can an organization or event use road guards? And again, we talk about number, minimum number of bikes, prior notification. Is prior notification permits required for the event? And finally, what equipment will the road guard be required to purchase and use? Just standing out there doing this doesn't get it. Because as you can see, I'm conspicuously dressed, right? So if I'm standing out in the intersection doing this, what's going to happen? I'm going to get flattened. So how about we put some kind of an identifier, an upper body reflective vest on them? How about one of those silly fold up panel stop signs? I'm gonna ask a real dating question. How many of you were ever traffic safety, uh, worked with the AAA program in your grade school that you were flaggers and held out the flag for kids as crossing guards? A couple hands good up. Good, that means you're as old as I am. Well, we actually did that. We stopped traffic. We actually had a flag that said stop and had AAA on it. We stood out there in the intersection. Remember that badge we had? There was a blue badge and then there was a red badge for lieutenant and I think the captain, you know, the captain of the program had a gold badge. But back in sixth grade, I was stopping traffic. I'm going, this is kind of cool. So taking that back a little bit, there are other people doing traffic control today. Let's be sure if this comes up as a potential program but the riding community has some input into it, whether you want it, whether you support it, and under what conditions it should actually take place. I want to conclude with this. The world is run by those who show up. 
for, for you showing up today, A, it means you're in a leadership position or you at least have an interest in motorcycle safety in the state of Texas. But understand what happens at a state level also has national implications. Because just as Minnesota is implementing their road guard program, other states like Ohio and Washington are looking to their program. So if you do something in Texas, don't just think it might stay in Texas. It might actually cross the borders and benefit some other states and other riding communities. So be very careful in what you think you want to do. Understand what you're biting off. In a case like this, this isn't going to happen overnight and it won't be free. But what's the tangential benefit to the, to the riding community? Does it make motorcycling safer? Does it reduce crashes? And if you can say that the sound issue, lane splitting, and perhaps road guard are three things you want to look at in Texas to get at some of those uh, motorcycle safety issues, then maybe use this as a resource. Uh, again, I thank you for your time and the invitation. Uh